Um, this is the first time I interviewed somebody in video, so she'll be great and I'll be a bit nervous, but she's the perfect first guest. And I've already um, thought about some of the questions and I'm really excited to see what she has to say. She's Jan, she's the person behind um, your parenting mojo and she knows everything about how to chill parents and uh, collaborate with our kids and approach each other as a team and set limits without frustration, how amazing that sounds. And yeah, so she has a lot to say about it and I'm gonna let her start by uh, explaining a bit in her own word, what is your parenting mojo and what is she trying to do with her podcast and her community? Hey there, thanks so much for having me. It's so great to be here. And it's always fun to be the first at doing something with someone. And <laughs> I got to uh, be coached through my first Instagram live a couple of days ago. So <laughs> we've all got to have a first time. So thank you for, for doing me the honor of letting me be your first. Um, so yeah, I host the Your Parenting Mojo podcast and it's a podcast that takes respectful uh, respectful principles on parenting as well as scientific research and, and really turns that into tools that parents can use to make decisions about making uh, about raising their children because when I found that my daughter turned about one I, I really needed a whole different set of tools than I had needed until that point and the information that I was getting from you know the free websites was I mean it would quote one scientific study and say new study says this and so you should do these five things and I'm thinking okay but how do I even know how that fits into the whole body of research on a topic and should I even pay attention to this? And, and that res resource was so lacking that I thought, okay, well, if it's, if I can't find it, if it's not out there, I'm going to create it myself. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. I think we've all been there and it's as a mom, I appreciate it because it's exactly what you say. You read something and it's like, okay, that's the answer to all my problems, but ah, uh, oh, what now? And there's a lot of conflicting things. And mm. so, um, what is for you like the biggest change? I mean, you say in your website, and I like it, that you didn't have maybe that n automatic instinct and you compensate with a lot of research. Mm -hmm. um, how, what is your biggest learning from all this road that you've taken into respectful parenting and all the studies? And, and you've educated, I mean, you've got a lot of relevant education on the way as well. So it's very... Mm -hmm grounded and very solid so what yeah. is that biggest change or that biggest lesson um, you've got from it I mean it's hard to pick one thing <laughs> Um, I would say that both respectful parenting and the scientific research have just fundamentally shifted how I parent, um, that they underpin every aspect of my relationship with my daughter, uh, and that they have enabled me to have such a different relationship with her than I believe I would have had if I had continued on the, uh, you know, Clearly, I have no idea what's going on here, and I don't know what to do about this approach that I was on when I first became a parent. So, I mean, it, it goes um, from, it, it cuts across every topic. I mean, just, just one simple example that I'm sure resonates with many parents is, uh, that we were forced to clear our plates when we were children and we, we were not allowed to leave food on our plates and we had to eat all the vegetables. There was just no way around that. Uh, and what does the scientific research say about that? Well, it says that if you use vegetables as a gateway food, uh, which is the idea that you have to eat your vegetables to get something else on the other end to get dessert, then you are causing the child to like vegetables less. And the only predictor of how many vegetables a child will eat is how much the child likes vegetables. <laughs> so you can make them eat their vegetables and you can feel, okay, I did my job today as a parent. I got these vegetables in. Um, and I never like to use sort of war metaphors, but in this case, I sort of feel like it's appropriate because it is sort of a battle when you set it up in that way. Um, you've won that battle. You got the vegetables in, but you're losing the war because your child is, is not liking vegetables anymore because of this and is probably actually going to like them less and eat fewer of them. I mean, and that, that cuts, that 
specific example is also relevant to a, a challenge that so many parents are facing right now related to online learning, particularly here in the US, uh, where, where children just don't want to do it. And so the parents say, well, do, do your online learning and then you can have screen time. <laughs> Same thing applies, you know, if, if, if we're making it, if there's a reward at the other end for doing it, we're going to like the thing that's in the middle less and we're not going to want to do it. And if we want to inspire a, a love of learning in a child, then we don't want to be rewarding them for doing that. I mean, that's just one tiny nugget of the kinds of things that have shifted uh, as a result of doing more than 120 podcast episodes on topics like this. And um, specific, you have a daughter. Um, yeah yourself um but you said that you well i know that that's a little bit of a spoiler i got from her before the interview but that you discover feminists or you got more engaged with feminists through yeah. your male friend and how he talk about how this system is um failing men a lot and taking away a lot from them so how that your method methodology or your approach to parenting match or clicks with a feminist education for kids? Yeah. I mean, I would say until probably a year ago, it really didn't. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I mean it, it did sort of tangentially, but it didn't explicitly. Um, I, I didn't really know a lot about feminism. You know, I, I know a decent amount about a decent number of things and I'd never really read that much about feminism and just kind of always thought, well, I'm a strong woman. Um, I, I have a, more of the traits that are considered characteristically, characteristically masculine and fewer of the characteristically feminine traits. And so, you know, my logic, my reasoning and all those things, my confidence and um, all of those things are really valued. And so I kind of I guess in the back of my mind, I just thought, well, what does feminism really have for me? You know, I wear bras, I shave under my arms. I, I <laughs> not that you can't be a feminist if you if you don't do those things no, uh, or if you do those things, um, but that I, I just didn't really have the inclination or the time, frankly, to dig any further into it. And then, yeah, my amazing friend, <laughs> Brian Stout, uh, we were having a series of conversations, and he was talking about his work on dismantling patriarchy, and I'm thinking okay, you're a white cishet male. <laughs> Why are you doing anything about patriarchy? You're the beneficiary of the system. And so uh, a series of newsletters that he published on that topic that are publicly available, and I can direct you to those if you'd like to share them with your listeners. Um, and so they uh, really opened my eyes. And I think I got the second one of those. And I said, dude, you're one of the smartest people I know. And I want to talk to you on the podcast about this. And so we started scheming about, well, who could we possibly get to talk about it? And of course, we went to uh, Dr. Carol Gilligan, uh, who has been writing about feminism for decades, is a luminary in the field. And I happened to have already interviewed one of her students. And so I said, would you mind <laughs> making an introduction? And she did. And Dr. Dr. Gilligan was gracious enough to accept. And the process of reading her book, um, which is uh, Why Does Patriarchy Exist, is uh, the, the latest one in a long line of research on that topic, was just eye-opening for me. It was, it was just staggering to see the connections between uh, feminism and the ways I was already parenting and, and the, the ways that I hadn't even seen that I needed to make shifts yet. Very good. Um... I mean, I completely agree with you in that sometimes it's not intuitive. I mean, for me, it wasn't. Like, for me, and I think for most people, feminism is quite a journey. And there's, and there's a lot of moments where it's like, wow, <laughs> it was just there the whole time. And, and just re-understanding what it means for us and globally. And, but I agree with you so much uh, in the fact that kids are the future and um, um, the biggest battle personally for me and uh, for a lot of people that I know is let's educate the kids better so they don't have to do the process that we're doing of learning and then I'm learning and then relearning. Yeah. So um, how does it look for you? Like which kind of tools or how kind of advice would you give to parents that are really worried about raising feminists in general and some humans um, yeah. in that aspect? Yeah, I, I think learning the this these distinctions between the the typically masculine and the typically feminine characteristics was a huge eye opener for me. 
um, because I hadn't really seen these things in that way before. And, and so I, I mentioned some of the masculine ones already and the feminine ones would be things like intuition and nurturing and caring and, you know, the, the characteristics that are sort of typically um, looked down on. And, and so I see that play out. You know, we, we encourage our girls to say, oh yeah, I can do anything. I could be an astronaut if I want to. Uh, we, we, we support them in learning about STEM subjects, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. But we never say to either our girls or our boys, you know, nurturing is important. Caring is important. <laughs> yeah. Careers in those fields are valuable as well. We need people who do those things. And if you have a, a unique skill of connecting with people, then there is really important work for you to do even if you're a girl and I, I want you to know this STEM stuff is available to you, <laughs> but, but this stuff is valuable too. And even if you're a boy, I mean, we, we have this idea that boys can't be caring. Boys can't be nurturing. Boys can be caring. They can they want to have these deep relationships with people, with their parents, with their peers. And it's our culture, our society that says, that boys can't have those things and that that creates this enormous tension in them that that says you know I, I want to have these relationships but I can't because they'll think I'm gay or you know some some crazy thing uh, that uh, you know, you can be gay and have close male relationships. You can be straight and have close male relationships. You can, you can, no matter how you identify, you can have close relationships with other people, but our culture tells us that you can't. Um, and, and so to give these messages to our children when they're young, I think is so, so, so important. Um, you know, specifically on, on uh, those characteristics issue. And then I think the other issue that's really important is the idea of the, the body brain split. Um, and, and this is something that I was learning kind of around the same time on a, on a parallel path, this idea that, you know, I process information in my head. I think it through, I reach a logical conclusion. And I had no idea that my body had any information for me <laughs> about how I'm doing, how I'm feeling, what's going on for me. And the process of reconnecting that uh, has, has been mind blowing. Um, and and I, I think that our children are born with that ability. Uh, they they are able to tune into their bodies. They they move their bodies uh, authentically. Um, I was watching my daughter. She was watching a, a movie last night, and she was she was uh, on the couch upside down, balancing on her head uh, with her legs over the back of the couch because it felt good. <laughs> it felt good to her to watch TV like that. Good for me. Yeah. And, and we have this, you know, have to be still, everything has to be contained. Uh, I don't listen to my body. If I, I have learned that I have this massive signal. If I feel nauseous, my body's trying to tell me something. I've learned that in the last year. I mean, for the last 30 years, maybe it's been trying to tell me this and, uh, and I haven't known how to pay attention. And so teaching our children Yes, pay attention to your mind, your feelings, your emotions, but also what's what's going on below the neck and, and don't forget about that as well. And incorporating that into your experience of the world, I think is going to be so critical to helping them live a more fulfilled life than we have lived and not get to mid middle age and think, oh, wait, <laughs> you suddenly magically discover there's this whole other world out there um, that we've been disconnected from our bodies for so long and, and now try and rebuild that connection. That's so good. I mean, I'm, I was, whenever you said it, it's like, I've been nauseous so many times. I'm going to start paying attention. And I think we don't know it. I think adults think this period in time, there's a lot of really exciting conversations happening that are clicking on us. And I think it's just dismantling the, the concepts we always had about right, good, you know, yeah. what success looks like, what a path is. And I think that we, framing everything it is being just really passionate to see and especially the new generations they're doing a great job uh changing literally everything um so what is your next goal what is the the ambition what is the goal of what you're creating yeah um, I mean, really what I'm trying to do is to support as many parents as I can to make this kind of shift in their own work. 
Um, and I do that through a couple of memberships that I offer right now. Um, the Finding Your Parenting Mojo membership is really uh, focused on uh, helping you with the things that are, you're struggling with in parenting right now. Because I think when parents are struggling with things like, you know, my, oh, my kid will eat anything as long as it's white. <laughs> <laughs> or my kids having emotion regulation issues, or I can't navigate screen time. We have this sort of tendency, tendency to see this as point problems. You know, this is the problem I'm having. This is the problem I'm having. When actually one of the big problems we're having is that we don't have a framework to work within. We don't have a way to solve problems with our children. So we set you up with that framework. And then once we've started to be able to generate a bit of breathing room for ourselves, because things don't seem quite <laughs> as urgent as they did, then, um, um, we, we give you new tools to talk with your partner uh, so that you can actually create a North Star and know what you're heading towards and know that uh, there are areas where you want to come into greater alignment and how to do that. And there are going to be some areas where we're not going to be like this. Our goal is not to be uh, the same parent as our partner. But how are we going to navigate that? Where, are we get, where do we want to overlap more? Where is it okay for us to be different? And how are we going to navigate that with our kids? Um, and, and then really getting clear on your goals and values. And, uh, you know, is it, is it incredibly important to me to uh, raise a son who is in touch with his physical uh, experience in the body? If yes, then I'm going to approach uh, some issues like how does my child interact with my in-laws differently than if another priority is of, of primary importance to me. So once we have that framework, then finding solutions on the little individual challenges just gets so much easier. Um, so, so that's sort of on the parenting side. And then on the learning side, we've, we've sort of talked mostly about the parenting side, but this stuff is in schools. <laughs> you know, what, why didn't I learn this stuff in school? It's because our culture doesn't, doesn't value it. Because logic and reasoning and being able to form an argument and, and convey that in writing is the, the, are the skills that are primarily valued. And I happen to be good at those things. And that's why I did well. Um, but uh, if we want our children to do differently, we need to uh, support their learning differently. And I, I sometimes I use the word teach, but I actually don't like that word because it implies that, the, that one person has all the knowledge and we're pouring that knowledge into somebody else when actually knowledge is kind of co-created between two people. And so uh, the Your Child's Learning Mojo membership really um, helps people to, to reimagine what learning can look like and, and leave their children, ra raise children with an intrinsic love of learning rather than that getting stamped out of them as it does in schools. I'm just nodding all the time. Like, <laughs> and is there, do you think there is hope to do that in the schools or is just let's all homeschool? I mean, do we all have to get our kids out of school and just understand that the system is broken? Or are they, is there a middle, it's a gray area in which you can just let them go to the system but reinforce things at home and how do you see that playing for yeah. families yeah i mean that that's that could be a conversation of <laughs> more than an hour in length oh, by no. itself um i in in the way that school is currently envisioned uh and practiced i don't see a way to consistently bring these ideas into a school setting uh, because every aspect of the way our children exist in the school environment reinforces ideas that go against the principles that we are talking about here. You know, all the behavior charts, the, the behavior modification, the, uh, the top-down knowledge, um, yeah. the, the whole lot of it goes against these principles. That said, there is nothing inherent to school that says these have to be components of it. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Sudbury model or the Summerhill model, as I know more common in the UK, um, which, is, which is basically the kind of interest-based learning that I'm describing through the membership, but that happens in school. So these are, these are special schools where you go and, and it's kind of a school in name only. You don't actually have to do anything at all while you're there. If you want to learn algebra, you can gather up five or six other people who want to know algebra and find somebody who knows more about it than you do and ask them to teach you. <laughs> um, and when children do that, they can learn massive amounts of information in a short period of time. And the difference is 
they they're motivated because they want to learn it because they've chosen to learn it and in school as it's currently envisioned there is no choice you can pick you, you might get to pick between one of two assignments the teacher has pre-selected, but there's no true choice about what you learn. And until there's choice in schools, I don't believe that we can ever truly incorporate feminist principles in school. But my hope is that uh, in the, the current uh, COVID induced changes to school, that we actually have an enormous opportunity to reimagine what school could look like that uh, there are going to be some uh, experiments that fail dramatically. You know, I'm seeing, <laughs> I'm doing a webinar tomorrow on um, how to survive Zoom school because I've, I've seen so many pictures of, of kids. I mean, there was one yesterday with the kid asleep with the headphones on <laughs> in front of Zoom school <laughs> with a schedule on the wall behind him that had him on, the, on Zoom calls from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, with, with a one hour break for lunch and no other breaks. Uh, so, so some of these things are not going to work. And then there are others that are going to incorporate asynchronous elements and, and all kinds of creative activities like meeting outside, meeting in, in places where we would never have thought to have school before. That I'm hoping that we can look at some of these and think, yeah, we're, we don't want to do that, but this is cool and that's cool from over there. And let's pull all these things together and reimagine what school is going to look like rather than just trying to as quickly as possible get back to the thing that we had before that felt safe and secure, but actually actually wasn't really serving our needs. I think what you offered, I mean, that resonates intuitively with a lot of people. And I'm hearing you and I'm like, yeah, I have two kids and I know that that will work better for them than trying to sit them down and force them to. Somebody was telling me the other day that her daughter has been told off in France. She's not even four years old for not writing her own name. Mm. My kids were like, why should kids know how to write their name at four? I mean, yeah. I don't think it's it says. important. <laughs> also, is that important? Really, from all the skills I want them to have, writing their name, really not in my name. But I like, like, what I love about your approach that it's very backed up by research. So for those parents that are more, more than the parents, probably the grandparents that are going to judge you for your decision, mm -hmm. you also bring the, look not only you know i think that's your that magic that also you bring to the table because a lot of people feel like okay intuitively that will work but mm, am i messing up with my kids do i want to be the weird parent that is doing completely different and i think that's where all your background um, the strength that you bring with your certain things it's extremely valuable um how has people responded to that or how that have you failed that it, that was one of the biggest impacts? Yeah, I think uh, it, it can be an enormous kind of pressure reliever for parents to find that the research actually uh, does back up their intuition. Um, and one way that this has played out is in research on early reading. Um, there, there's a big push, particularly here in the US, to get children reading as early as possible because we have this sense that uh, we're so behind. There's so much information to convey in the school years and we're not able to do it. And the only solution to that is to get children reading earlier so that we can, get, we can have that extra year of being able to convey information to them. Um, and of course, <laughs> that uh, is a problem when children are not developmentally ready to read yet. Uh, 50 years ago, we weren't teaching children to read in kindergarten. That was a first grade skill. Now reading is a kindergarten skill and you're supposed to learn it there. Um, and there, there's, no, uh, there's no kind of choice in this or say in this, you're going to be taught how to read um, and, and until there is consent here. I mean, this is, this, is, this is at the core of it, right? That you get to decide what is appropriate for you and for your child. Uh, and until that consent-based element is there, we're, we're, we can never integrate feminism with school. Um, but, but what the research has showed it on the reading front is that children who learn to read late and we're talking, you know, age seven. But in, in a couple of years after that, there's no difference between the reading ability of those children. 
And the only problem that it creates in school for children who can't read is because they can't, uh, they can't process the material that's given to them in class because uh, written information is the, the fastest, most efficient way of conveying information from teacher to student. So that's why it's required. But if we were to permit other ways of learning through videos, through audio, through uh, watching a more knowledgeable peer, through doing sort of even apprentice model with grandparents or you know, whoever in the community who has an important skill, then our children could learn so much, even if they can't read. And then when they're ready, they will learn how to read and they will very quickly catch up and it will not be an impediment to them. So it's our view of, you know, this is how, this is the right way for every child. Every child must learn to read by this age and have these certain skills by this point or they're not succeeding. Um, and, and we're all different. You're different from me. You, you have different skills than I do. Why does it make sense to, te to treat us all the same? Until we can bring in this, this idea that uh, that learning needs to be customized, not, not to each little delicate flower because we're all so amazingly special, but, but that we have unique qualities and, and we, we all are good at something, we all struggle at something. Let's help the individual child with their particular struggles. Let's allow them to shine with their particular qualities, even if it's not reading and it's not something that's been traditionally valued in school. And let's raise a rounded person who sees, yeah, I'm really good at this. I'm gonna focus on this. This is a strength. I also need to do some work here as well. Yeah, that, and, and yeah, and it sounds, um, and I see how that clicks with feminists so much, and especially feminists in early ages in which the, the research shows that there's more difference between a group of boys than between the average boy and yes. the average girl. So yes. it's like, but we are still, as soon as they're born, it's like, okay, I'm going to give you your baggage here, your bag yes. there, we're going to focus. And, and then we'd make experiments when they're adults. And it's like, it's nature. They're different. It's like, yeah, yeah. No, no. Of course they're different now. I mean, you have 30 years to to shape them into what you wanted them to be from the moment they were born. Um, so all that you're saying sounds like music to my ears, all the let's kids be different and just, you know, they are who they are. And mm -hmm. doesn't mean, you know, as you said, like everybody is so special, we need to create a whole system for them, but just let them tap into their uniqueness and, and just give them that space of choices and yeah. Yeah. So thanks, that was amazing. I'm going to do my feminist questionnaire because mm. I'm always loving to hear more about feminism and people's journey. So what mm. is feminist for you? There's no right or wrong answer, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you say, so. Well, uh, before we get into the questionnaire, I mean, I will acknowledge again that uh, I am not widely read on this topic and <laughs> um, uncomfortable of presenting myself as, as any sort of even remotely, you know, expert on this topic. There are so many people who know so much more about this than I do. So I'll just speak from, from what I've read so far. And if, if people are looking at this in a year and thinking, whoa, I bet she knows a lot more now, then <laughs> chances are that's true. So, um, so I guess for feminism for me, I guess, as I understand it right now is, is allowing and supporting both girls and boys, <laughs> men and women and, and everybody, no matter where they identify on that spectrum, uh, to express the full range of their knowledge and their feelings. Um, so that they can uh, have a full experience as people rather than having to fracture off some part of themselves that isn't considered socially acceptable. And for women, that's often uh, the, the knowledge part of it. And for men, that's often the feelings part of it. But we all have both aspects on, and each, each of those should be valued so that we can, we can have this full experience. Just to clarify, part that the, the answer is Perfect. I mean, like, I think, I think the value of these is um, understanding, and I believe 100% in these, that you don't need to be super knowledgeable. I, I think that's the problem with feminists, that people feel sometimes that it's like, can I even call myself feminist if I yeah. do all these other things? And what I am fascinated about is hearing all the voices and all the ideas and all the approaches and I'm sure most people, and I don't know anybody that would not agree with your definition of feminist, but it's just okay. how <laughs> it, is, it is different for everybody. And that is, I think, what makes it 
great to feel like, oh, I will have this very different, but totally what you do is absolutely what feminist is. And I think that is the wow of it. Hmm. Um, and what, okay. What, um, yeah, what everyday sexism really bothers you? <laughs> well, I think one thing that we've alluded to and then another thing that you alluded to in your question already um, was uh, the idea that we do encourage girls to pursue STEM careers and, uh, and say, you know, you can be anything you want to be. And then we, we don't encourage either a girl's or a boy's to pursue nurturing professions because we don't value that knowledge and those skills. Um, to me, that's a massive missed opportunity. Uh, we, we, we need more people than ever before who have those skills. So, uh, so making them kind of walled off and well, they you can, you could do those if this doesn't work out, you know, if, if this, if you're not, if you're not that good at engineering, then we can consider yeah. this stuff, but it's, it's not a first choice that that part is something I'm actively working on. And then the other part in, in your, your question about, um, or your observation about how we treat children differently from birth. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the, the study on um, where researchers took a baby. I'm actually not even sure <laughs> uh, if the baby was a boy or a girl or had been assigned boy, boy or girl, um, but they dressed it up in boy clothes and gave it to some participants and, and said, you know, and here's a baby. Oh, how strong you are. You kick those legs, you go at it. And then dress the baby up, baby up in girls clothes and give it to other participants. Oh, you're so cute. Look at you. You're so delicate. <laughs> oh, you're so beautiful. Uh, and this is the same baby dressed <laughs> in different clothes um so yeah this this idea that uh that these characteristics are inbuilt and you summarize it perfectly there's there's more difference between <laughs> an individual boy and girl than there is between boys and girls on average and the the more we can see that and and put systems in place to maybe even like i i just stopped asking people when they announce they're pregnant i won't ask them is it a boy or a girl um, because I think the reason we do that is because it feels like there's nothing else to know about them yet. <laughs> but if we can get out of that, then maybe that will be the first step towards allowing all of our children to have this full expression. I, I agree so much with the caring thing. I think the fact that we naturally devalue everything that is perceived as woman is like, okay, I believe that feminism is about about empowering women to be whatever they want but also boys and the fact that we automatically reject what sounds like feminine is like yeah you're there you can like any color but look boys you can look pink too there's nothing wrong with it you can also yeah. be a nurse nurses are fine but is that automatic in our head feeling like the things that are identified with feminine are second class and feminist is about getting the girls to the first class. It's like, yes, that's not what feminist is. Feminist yeah. is about breaking classes and making loads of choices for everyone. And I think that's where a lot of people um, will get on board. I think that's where a lot of people will be like, yeah, wow, that's, that makes a difference. It's not about empowering women and telling women what they can do, which it is as well, mm -hmm. but it's about much more. So. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, one. until a year ago, I didn't know that. And I think that a lot of parents out there are, are right where you're describing. Like, yes, I, I believe that women should have every opportunity that men and boys have. Um, and until you really start learning more, you don't realize that there's this whole other thing underneath there <laughs> yeah. because our society is, is has conditioned us to not think about it to not even be aware that there's this other thing there and that's it's important and that we should be considering it yeah no 100 percent and um i already know when you start identifying as feminist and why and you've said it that it was thanks to your um friend brian so thanks brian stout uh, <laughs> i know right <laughs> <laughs> love it can't wait to meet him um i'm gonna stalk him on the internet anyway <laughs> um, and and yeah and, and you said that he was also your biggest feminist role model which i think is great um i think men have to have a voice in this i mean i don't think and i get a lot of backlash on the internet every time exactly. i talk about men because i should call my shop 
the men's rights shop because I talk about men. It's like, okay. Um, <laughs> but I do think and this website, like the website is founded by me and my husband and, and we are both, he was probably one of the biggest feminist influences for me when I started mm. to identify as a feminist. And we have a son and a daughter. And this is for all of us. What we're doing is not like, I mean, and I think it's so great when men speak up and put themselves in a position of, look, this is important and I'm going to use my a lot of time privileged voice to speak about a topic that sometimes when it comes to women from women, sounds more like, oh, she's whining again. And when it comes with men, it's like, let's listen what they have to say. So <laughs> you know, but I'm not even saying it in a bad way. Like, I think sometimes men speaking about feminism it's more impactful for other men because men listen to men more. Yeah. So it's amazing that he's doing that. And hell yes, Brian. <laughs> um, so I ask in my questionnaire, but I'm gonna ask you now here, what is your proud feminist victories? And you mentioned that you're not very into victories. So I wanna hear about that. Mm, yeah. I. I guess in a way it goes back to the kind of, you know, the war metaphor and the parts that are baked into our culture and, and seeing it as a victory uh, to me. And, you know, of course, everybody can see it in their own way. But when I when I read that word, I was just thinking, I don't know if I've had any victories and I don't know if I want to have any victories. Um, and, and it feels like because this hurts us it hurts you and me as women and it hurts our partners as men and and all of the other men and all of the other women and everybody else in the world this this is hurting them that to to frame it as a victory felt for me um like it wasn't something i wanted to be involved in but that if we can instead frame it as healing um and the idea that that we need to heal ourselves and help each other heal and heal our culture so that we can have this full experience as people, um, that that is more something I want to be a part of. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that was just how that word kind of rang, rang for me. No, that's, I was, um, when I was reading your answer, I was like, I'm going to have to change the whole questioner in the future. But <laughs> for me, whenever I read it, what I thought is like, yeah, I, I'm very into journeys, like, so, and I would be like, what is the proudest moment of, you know, the journey? Like, what is the milestone on it? And, you know, that thing that we're like, that was great. I, that was part. And, and I like your idea of healing and, you know, just becoming and, and moving and, and all that. So, yeah, I think that was very um, impactful. So I'll take it. I'll take the feedback. <laughs> um, and you recommended um, Dr. Carol uh, Gilligan's book, which I'm going to link so people can and check yeah it. in part because it's amazing and in part because honestly i don't have a lot of other <laughs> books to recommend i mean I've, I've read all of her books in preparation for talking with her and and that one i think really uh, i mean obviously it's the most current um but it, it really draws together a lot of themes from her earlier work um, and then her co-author Naomi Snyder uh, had an experience where her father died when she was young and, um, and, and kind of weaving in that narrative as well and, and how that impacted their views on this topic. I mean, to me, it was, it, I dog-eared <laughs> half the corners in the book. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I would definitely recommend that one. Brilliant. And, um, and yeah, and what is your call to action? So... Tell us what you <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I think the thing about my work is that I don't tell you what to do. I, I tell you what I see and some tools that you can consider uh, adjusting and modifying to make them fit in your world. So, um, so, so my call to action would be the idea that if we don't raise our children differently than we were raised, and if we don't teach them or help them to learn differently than we were taught, then differently than our learning was supported, then we, we can't expect a different result. The, the patriarchal culture that we sit within now is not going anywhere and it will be here with us for another generation. 
Um, and it, it seems to me, and I think to some other people, to, to, to Brian as well, <laughs> and other people that, um, that one of the most powerful tools that we have, and not in a power over kind of way, but in a, um, you know, a most impactful kind of way to change our culture is through the way we raise our children. So these, uh, the decisions that we make about parenting on a daily basis, you know, if we tell our, our boys, you know, grow up, boys don't cry, uh, be a real man, that if we believe in feminism and the promise that it holds, and yet we are talking with our boys in that way, then, then we're not connecting the dots here. Um, uh, if we are uh, protesting for Black Lives Matter and we're saying, you know, uh, fight the power, um, we, we, everybody should have equal decision making rights. And then we go home and we force our child to brush their teeth. Then what our child is learning is that you, you, some people have power over other people and the people who have more power can make the people who have less power do things rather than finding a different way to hear everybody's voices and, and figure out how can we both move forward on this issue together. So um, I, I think that this is, this is not something we fix immediately. I still screw it up on a regular basis. Everybody I know screws it up on a regular basis, but that by everybody, setting the intention, <laughs> <laughs> by setting the intention to do something differently and and when we see ourselves screw up to say oh yeah that's that's not what i meant that's not how i want to move forward and to address that with a child and to do things differently next time i mean th this is how we shift culture we're doing it we're, we're doing it right now well yeah i agree um and yeah i'm a big fan myself of educating our kids better and i have so much hope on them which means relies on a lot of responsibility on us it can be overwhelming mm -hmm. so yeah i am definitely gonna link um your website and your podcast and all that because i know people will want to know more and hear more and get all the tools and all the framework um and yeah i'm a big um fan and i'm gonna do it myself as a mom and i know i'm gonna need all the tips and advice because we hold a huge responsibility as parents and and not enough information or tools or maybe too much information coming from everywhere um, yeah and it can be a bit overwhelming it can so that's great that you're giving a community and a space to navigate all that and i'll link all that and thanks a million for your time and to share your feminist and parenting views Thanks for having me on. It was so much fun. I hope it wasn't too stressful. <laughs> yeah. and, um, you were great. So that was the first of it. It's great to have somebody there that knows what it's doing. So I didn't feel completely lost. Um, hopefully my second will be well versed too until I get a little bit on track. But um, yeah, thanks a million. Thanks, Virginia. It was great.